morning, I, I had the pleasure of meeting Don Jorge, and it's such an honor. I've been hearing about you for a very long time. So it's really such a pleasure that I'm able to be here with, the, with you and with the family. I'm sorry that La Señora Edith um, couldn't be here with us, but it really is um, a great honor to be able to be here to celebrate 100 years, but really what you've done for, oh, there it is, thanks, for, um, for health. Um, I, I would say uh, pub public health, population health. Um, my wife is an obstetrician gynecologist who did her specialty in family planning and um, you helped to create family planning. So, um, <laughs> Can you put it on. Um, I'm gonna speak for a few minutes about what is the research project that was the most meaningful project I've ever been involved in. And it's a project that started when I was at the National Institute of Public Health in Mexico. And uh, it was in the prisons in Mexico City. And uh, there are 40,000 prisoners in Mexico City. And uh, I'll tell you, explain why a little bit later, but uh, the program is called Ponte a Prueba, which um, me translated into English means like, put yourself to the test, right? And in this case, the test was HIV, although as, as I'll explain, it was a little broader than HIV. Um, Sergio Bautista um, became the PI of the project after I left and did most of the work. Um, it all happened thanks to Andrea Gonzalez, who's the director of the National AIDS, of the City AIDS program in Mexico City, and who developed the relationship with the, um, the prison system. And Lisa de Maria, who has worked for me in Mexico and is now working for me at Berkeley, um, who has helped me pull the, the materials together. A um, couple of things to think about with respect to prisons. Um, one is that almost everybody in prison ends up leaving prison, including what I would argue is probably the most famous prisoner ever. Um, so anybody who thinks that prisons are a place where things happen and stay there is wrong. Prisoners go in and they go out, and they go in and out a lot. In Mexico, <coughs> they also, the community comes into the prison. Um, has anybody here ever been in, inside a Mexican prison? Um, actually, surprisingly, more than you might expect. Um, I, I did a project when I was in high school. I toured all the prisons in, in Colorado, which is where I lived at the time. And when I went to the prisons uh, in Mexico City, I was amazed because it's nothing like an American prison. It's nothing like a movie prison. Um, a Mexican prison is a village with walls around it. And the community comes into the prison and the outside community then leaves the prison. The prisoners stay there. But there's an extraordinary amount of contact. Um, it's a flow in and flow out. You go on visit day and there's just a, a miles and miles, it feels like, of people in lines getting in, families, children, um, food, there's a market inside. It's a, it's a very different place than what people imagine as, as a prison. And you can see here with a mother and kid, conjugal visits are common, normal in Mexican prisons. So the idea that anything that happens from a health perspective in prison not only do, comes out because prisoners come out, but it comes out because people who are visiting prisoners come out, and of course, the guards go in and out every day. Um, this is a nice picture of, a, of a people getting ready to get married in prison um, in Mexico. Now, one, the, sort of the most famous example in my world, because I'm a guy who's worked a lot on HIV, is the example of Bangkok and the 80s. So there were some pretty effective programs working with injecting drug users in Bangkok to reduce the risk of HIV transmission by providing safe needles and needle exchange, by teaching people how to sterilize their syringes, by drug substitution, et cetera. But yet we saw this incredibly rapid rise in um, HIV infection among drug users. And the problem is that in prison, 50% of the drug users inject and 90% of the ones who inject share equipment because there's no needle exchange program in prison. So the prisons were serving as the cauldron, the incubator, for the spread of HIV in the whole city. Because drug users go in and out of the prison, and in the prison they get infected and then go out into the community. So that was, that's just the most famous example in, in, in the area that I've worked in, where prison clearly has a major effect on, on public health more broadly. Although obviously we should care about the health of prisoners in the prison and not just about the impact on the broader community. In, um, in Mexico, before we did the study, which, which we started putting together in 2008, the prison population in Mexico City had tripled and was 40,000 prisoners by the time uh, we started the city, the study, with lots of, poor, uh, lots of poor living conditions as a result of overcrowding, 
Um, limited access to, to water, sanitation, medical care, access terrible, lots of uh, poor quality medical care and corrupt access to it, and obviously high levels of drug use um, to the point where you walk into the prison, I mentioned the market, and as part of the market you can buy tamales, but you can also buy the drug you want out on the counter, um, choose the pill you, you feel like. And the level of, of uh, so when we first started the study, one thing that happened was the H1N1 flu epidemic happened. And so our first job was not to actually do the study I'm going to talk about, was to screen 40,000 prisoners for flu. And in one prison, there was a patient who had been hospitalized the night before with, with pulmonary symptoms. And uh, so I went, because the rest of the team was sort of seeing the whole cell block, but I went to that cell to, because we kept the prisoners in the cell um, to test them, to make sure that uh, there wasn't. So I, I, I opened the door of the cell, which in Mexico are not like the U.S. because people put things all over the doors. You can't see into the cells. They're just bars with like fabric behind them, and I opened the door to step in, and I was like, because it was papered with people. Like, the, there was no place to put your foot down, even right inside the door. The cell was so crammed. In a, what should have been a normal cell, there were 35 people. And, uh, and it turns out that if I had to be imprisoned, I would much rather be in prison in Mexico than in the U.S., because I have money. And with money in a Mexican prison, you live very well. But these guys in that particular cell was the opposite end of the spectrum. If you don't have money in a Mexican prison, you live a very, very crowded existence. So um, Mexico is one of the largest prison populations in Latin America, but um, let's not forget where we are. We're in the country that imprisons more people than any place in the world. It makes Russia look good. It makes South Africa look good. Um, Mexico is not low, um, but it's really low compared to the U.S. Before anybody um, think, yeah, gets, gets on too high a horse. <laughs> um, the, um, what we've seen with respect to HIV in prisons around the world is a much higher prevalence. And so this study started because we didn't know what the, the relative prevalence was of HIV in Mexican prisons. And, um, and so that led to this collaboration to start a project looking at, at uh, HIV in prisons. But if you're new to me, to the idea of doing a research study in Mexican prisons, or in any prison, um, I don't have to remind anybody in the room, I don't think, that there's a very long history of people doing really bad things with respect to research in prisons. And this is the doctor's trial from Nuremberg, which is the most famous, most horrible example. But um, there are many examples, including in this country, of people doing um, research with prisoners in a way that uh, damaged prisoners. And, um, so, as you can imagine, um, this is more recently from the U.S., um, when you think about doing a study in the prison, um, even if it's for the good of the prisoners, there are a lot of people in prison who don't have any reason to believe that you're there for their benefit. Because most of the people they come into contact with are there to extort money from them, to be violent to them, to make their lives miserable. Um, it's hard to engender trust in a population of prisoners and um, so when we went into the prison, ostensibly to do a study of HIV prevalence, um, we realized very quickly that nobody was going to roll up their sleeve and give us access to their blood so that we could do a study of HIV prevalence unless we did a whole lot to establish trust with that population. And what ended up happening was a program which was called Ponte a Prueba. And, um, the idea, you know, put yourself to the test in the double sense of the word. It's the same double sense in, in, in Spanish. The idea is get yourself tested, but also like, you know, step up. Um, don't be afraid. And, um, and we got, um, we got uh, an actor um, to help us. Um, what's his name? Camacho. Who can tell me what his name is? Um, I'm blocking. But he's sort of a Bruce Willis character, and uh, he was in... Um, y tu mamá también, and a number of other movies. I didn't know, <laughs> I didn't know him before. Um, and, uh, and we had him uh, do días. some outreach. Hola, soy Daniel Jiménez Cacho. Soy actor. A lo mejor me has visto en alguna película. Actualmente coordino un taller de teatro para internos. Tengo algo muy importante que decirte. Es un reto que te quiero plantear y que puede cambiar tu vida. Porque el reto es tu salud. Ponte a prueba. 
Se está haciendo un estudio para conocer el estado de salud de los internos y custodios de todos los centros penitenciarios en el Distrito Federal. Te invito a que aceptes el reto y formes parte del estudio. Vas a saber cómo está tu salud y qué puedes hacer para cuidarla. Y si algo anda mal, podrás seguir el tratamiento que se te ofrece. Es una oportunidad de darte una revisada de manera gratuita, confidencial y voluntaria. El estudio abarca las enfermedades que causan la mayoría de las muertes e incapacidades en nuestro país, como hipertensión arterial, diabetes, exceso de grasas en la sangre y algunas de las infecciones más graves y contagiosas como tuberculosis, sífilis, VIH SIDA, herpes genital, hepatitis B y hepatitis C. Tu cuerpo es tu espacio y también tu responsabilidad. Mientras vives en reclusión, tu cuerpo y tu mente son tu territorio y está en tus manos cuidarlos, nutrirlos y desarrollarlos. Además, tu estado de salud afecta directa o indirectamente a tus familiares y amigos. ¿Y quién mejor que tú para cuidarte a ti mismo? Los médicos han descubierto la gran importancia que tiene el autocuidado, porque cuando sabes cómo cuidarte es más fácil prevenir enfermedades. So you can see we started with HIV, we ended up with chronic illnesses and a whole raft of infectious diseases because then we were giving information to people, many people, instead of the few HIV infected uh, prisoners that they could use and that the health services could use to, to help people. Um, he was very helpful. We ended up getting almost 90% of participation of, um, I'm sorry, just over 80% participation of the men and over 90% participation of women um, in the study. So the, the trust ended up being built, but it was, it was not um, a simple process. Um, just to give you a touch of, of information about the results, you can see here that um, in HIV, we didn't have anywhere near the differences that are seen in a number of other countries. Pretty good sized difference in hepatitis C, which is very commonly transmitted with injecting drug use, not surprisingly. Hepatitis B, almost the same. And then syphilis, interestingly, if you look at men and women, women much higher on syphilis, men lower in the prison population in syphilis. And I can't remember for this slide whether it was age corrected or not. But I suspect the expl explanation here is that the proportion of women in prison who've been involved in sex work and prostitution is much higher than for men. And that probably explains the differential rates on syphilis. And for men, it's probably a function of them being younger. Um, This is obesity. You can see up at the top, the pink and the red are women inside and outside of prison. They're almost equally obese. Um, and down below, men, men significantly less obese in prison. And lots of hypotheses for that. One that you can imagine is that if you're in a violent world, you spend more time keeping in shape if you're in prison than you might on the outside world. Um, but obviously, it's also um, corrected by which end of the socioeconomic distribution uh, people are from. Um, Lots of drug use. 70% among, among men have either before or during prison used drugs. And the use of marijuana in prison is approximately 50%. Um, so, and I have to say that if you spend a little bit of time there, you understand why you might be in that 50%. <laughs> It's probably a nicer way to spend your time in prison. But what's interesting on the far side there, you can see relatively little heroin, at least in 2009 and relatively little injected drugs, which is why in the Mexico City prisons, unlike what I told you about in Bangkok, uh, we didn't have anywhere near as much HIV infection as one might have expected. Um, but the amazing thing that we found, and this was really shocking, so when I first went to the prison, I'll show you the picture of the guy that I, I met with the very first time I went. He was the leader of the prison's HIV prevention team. And when we went in, this is the results of patients who are receiving treatment for their HIV infection. And this is a measure of what proportion of the patients have effective treatment, because the virus in their blood is suppressed down so that it's not replicating. And when we went in, 25% of the patients of those who were on treatment, and the only patients who can be on treatment are those who are alive, 20%, 25% of the patients had effective treatment. And as you can see, just two years later, we had levels that were as good as the best clinics in, in Mexico. Um, uh, and this is all of the patients in Mexico City concentrated in one prison. 
And I say of those who are still alive, because 25% effective treatment means the other 75% are continually dying. So the actual percentage of all the prisoners who have effective treatment is lower than that, because the denominator keeps dying, and all you've got is the numerator. This just shows you that of those who are diagnosed, this is now 2015, patients are linked to medical care, they're started on treatment, and they have viral suppression. Um, so this is the pretty current picture, it's, you know, a couple years, a uh, year ago. Um, but the medical care for prisoners, when I went in, people were in the HIV pavilion, they were cachectic, they were lethargic, they were really sick. And when I went back, I just, I have to say, I started crying because um, it was so incredible, the difference that had happened with those prisoners. Um, when they get out of prison, I mentioned people go in and out, especially prisoners with HIV. Um, this is the Clinica Condesa, is the, uh, the clinic, now there are two, but uh, before there was one clinic in Mexico City that uh, provided most of the outpatient care for the Ministry of Health patients. Now 95% of the prisoners being released start on care in the clinic. So there's basically a, a procedure for making sure that the patient who leaves prison is linked to care. And this is the guy that I mentioned to you. Now, I, I met him the first time I went to the prison. He was imprisoned for murder when he was 18 years old. Uh, his sentence was 50 years. Um, he was in prison for murder because the gentleman who'd been sexually abusing him started to sexually abuse his little brother, and that led to him being killed. Um, he was 18, so he was sentenced as an adult. Um, and not only was he sexually abused, he was HIV infected by, by his abuser. Um, so I met him 24 years later or something like that. And in the meanwhile, he had started an HIV prevention program in the prison. Uh, he'd kept himself in remarkably good shape. Um, and he'd married a physician on the outside. Um, uh, uh, and was a remarkable guy. Um, so remarkable that a couple months later, I brought my 17-year-old son to meet him. And um, I, those of you who grow up in privileged Mexico can imagine that my son didn't think he had anything in common with prisoners in Mexico City. Um, and uh, after spending an hour with this guy, I went and did my work, and I just left my kid talking to this guy. And um, he came out of prison, and he was just sitting in the car going, this is so wrong. We have to get him out of there. <laughs> it, was, it was really a transformative thing for him to realize that um, there are lots of stories uh, in the prison. And, um, and Alfredo Vite is, uh, is an incredible story. So let me show you. Uh, this is... A, um, a tape that was made in 2011 by actually the ex-husband of the program director who, it's a long one, I'm just going to show you a short clip, um, of the prisoners who were in the ward. I mean, I recognize every single person who appears in this, um, in this video. Um, and uh, you'll see just a few minutes. <laughs> Hay un área que es hasta atrás de los encamados, hay un cuartito en donde tiene su puerta de madera y su baño aparte. Nosotros le, le decimos ese cuartito en la, en la sala de despegue, ¿no? Porque todo el que entra ahí es porque ya, ya se va libre, ¿no? Por la, con las patas por delante. Llego y me encuentro a una persona que sin masa muscular, era el puro esqueleto, ya no veía, no se podía levantar. Félix se llamaba. Ahora, ¿te mueres? Ya, te moriste, sí, ya, van a llorar por ti. No, pues no. Entonces, mejor disfruta la vida, dice. Velo, dice. Todos los que están ahí en el 10, aunque no son nada tuyos, tú lo viste, todos los niños se preocuparon por ti. Y me dijo unas palabras bien, que quedaron grabadas. Me dijo, veas como veas las cosas, nunca dejes de aventarle padena. Como he aprendido a sobrevivir aquí por mis compañeros, me han enseñado cómo vivir con el VIH, que el VIH no es mi enemigo, 
es mi compañero tengo que aprender a vivir con él para que no me acabe y somos gente que tenemos sensibilidad somos gente igual que los demás y a lo mejor un poco más sensibles por lo mismo de estar infectados pero pues uno no deja de, de sentir y pensar ¿no? hay siempre una nueva oportunidad y pues siempre con la frente en alto Independientemente de la situación de la persona, está en reclusión, eh, sea hombre, sea mujer, este, sea rico, sea pobre, los servicios de salud es un derecho humano. ¿Quieres curarte? Sí. ¿Quieres vivir? Sí. A la gente que realmente toma medicamento, no lo que no lo dejen de tomar. Cada uno de ellos que ya tenemos una calidad de vida mucho mejor a la de antes, por la atención que hay al día de hoy, que en su mayoría estamos todos indetectables. Antes, antes se morían de tiro por viaje. Hoy el VIH no tiene por qué ser una pena de muerte, ni tiene por qué nadie con VIH eh, morir por esto. Con VIH o sin VIH uno sigue siendo ser humano, estando preso no sigue teniendo, sigue sintiendo cariño por los demás. Well, that, that gives you a sense of um, how things have transformed um, in uh, Santa Marta um, over the last few years. And um, this last picture here on the left-hand side is Florentino, who was the physician who agreed to come into the prison and assume responsibility for care of the prisoners. He was the one who basically single-handedly turned it around. Um, it involved getting the director of the prison health service in Santa Marta fired, um, but we managed to achieve that. Um, and, um, and Alfredo Vita, uh, Vite is um, now free. Um, so he was liberated from prison um, just a, a year ago. And uh, this is the inauguration of the new HIV clinic in Mexico City, La Clinica um, Jaime Sepulveda, um, in Ixtapalapa. Um, Andrea Gonzalez is the director of the National AIDS Program, and then the woman on the right, whose name I forget, is the woman responsible now for the diagnosis program, where everybody who comes into prison in Mexico City now gets a voluntary HIV test, and if they're positive, gets transferred to this pavilion. Thanks very much. <laughs> Happy if anybody's got any questions. Happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Actually, it's, um, I've been up to Sacramento a couple of times to talk with, um, if you go up and speak with the legislators in, in California, one of their top priorities in the health space is prison health. Um, the state prison system in California is under federal receivership um, with a federal oversight um, uh, for prison health. And um, so this is actually something that all of the, the medical campuses and, and public health schools in the state should collaborate on. It's, a, it's, a, it's an unfinished project. Um, I've actually had significant discussions with UCSF about it, but I'd, I'd love to have a discussions with Stanford about it. Actually, I, the fact that I'm here, you know, proves that we are allowed to come. Um, <laughs> um, it's sort of like vampires and crosses. You can, you can go to vampires with a cross, and as long as you wear blue and gold, we're allowed to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, everybody.